Thanks, Christine. Uh, and thank you to the McMaster Alumni Association for inviting me here today. Um, the timing of this talk actually uh, was done on purpose to coincide with the start of the new uh, term for high school. Uh, because I think it's a good time to think about renewal and rethink about some of the habits that you've been following and how you might want to alter your workflow to increase your own academic success. Um, I want to start off by telling you a story from uh, a book that I, I just recently read. I've heard so much about it. It's The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Uh, and there's a story in it called uh, Sharpening the Saw. Um, and it goes something like this. There's a, a woodcutter uh, out in the forest uh, working very hard to uh, take down a tree. He's been working at it for days, sweat, he's hungry. Uh, and a passerby comes and says, you know, what are you doing? And he says, isn't it obvious? I'm trying to take down this gigantic tree. And the passerby says, well, have you noticed uh, like, how dull your saw is? Uh, and, he, and the woodcutter says, well, I know, but I'm so busy cutting down this tree, I don't have time. Can't you see, I've got, after this tree, I've got all these other trees in the forest to cut down. And the lesson here is that if he just took a moment to sit back and look at his situation and took that extra thought to sharpen his saw, he would get that much further ahead. Each of his strokes would actually have been more, much more productive. And that is the basic premise of my entire presentation tonight. I want to talk about how you can sharpen your saw. So the first part of this is understanding what your ultimate goal is. Are you trying to learn for the short term or are you trying to engage in what psychologists call durable learning? So learning for the long term beyond this single test onto the final exam and looking ahead to other courses that depend on you understanding this information. The second point about uh, sharpening the saw that I want to make is trying to learn to be proactive rather than reactive. I know a lot of students and a lot of my colleagues uh, really are in em running around in emergency mode where there's a fire here, so they run and they dump all their resources on that fire. Once that fires out, you move on to the next one and so on. So a person is in a constant state of stress and anxiety. The third point is to really think of the big picture. Um, you can go on adrenaline for so long, but afterwards there's a cost to pay. And an important part that I try to work into my own life and schedule as well is thinking about making restoration part of the workflow. And it's just as important as every other aspect of your schedule. Okay. So let me start by telling you uh, a story about myself. Um, I'm pretty competitive, uh, and when I lived in California as a postdoc, one of the things I really wanted to do was to try a sprint triathlon. So this is kind of like a, a baby triathlon. Um, and there are three different types of skills that you need to complete this uh, triathlon. You have to be able to swim, you have to be able to bike, and you have to be able to run. And the only problem was that I didn't know how to swim. I could sort of swim, I could kind of get by. Um, the most, uh, the furthest distance I had ever gone was about 100 meters in a swimming pool. On this race day, I would have to swim 750 meters in an open water swim, which is also very different. Um, and I continued to bike and I continued to run training for this race and believe it or not I actually procrastinated learning how to swim efficiently for this race. It was about one week before the race where I started to panic and I thought you know I really need to learn how to swim because this race is coming up in a week. So I had crammed for this uh, race. So every day I went to the swimming pool and I tried to swim a little bit further. The first day I could do 50 meters, the second day I could do 100 meters. I got as far as 400 meters and then I was just too tired and I thought I have to rest the next day. So I went to the race and I had never 
uh, done this distance of 750 meters. If you know anything about these races, they start you off in waves and by age group, and they separate you about by about five minutes. As I was going through, uh, I was very excited. I started swimming, and people just started flying past me. Uh, people from waves behind me started catching up and passing. Uh, at one point, uh, I think women in their 50s were passing me by. Um, and the entire time, there were some very concerned lifeguards in, on surfboards on either side of me, keeping sort of a respectful distance, so I had some dignity. But every once in a while, they would shout out, is everything OK, sir? And I'm exhausted, and I'd have to use some energy and say, yes, I'm fine. So by the time I finished the, the, the swim portion, 45 minutes had gone by. And just to give you some uh, perspective, uh, most people can finish this in about 15 to 20 minutes. When I stepped out, I was absolutely exhausted. And my body was so upset with me, but I'm so stubborn that I forced myself to finish through the bike and the run, uh, and it was a miserable day. And so you would think to yourself, why would anyone cram for a triathlon? Well, that is a, a, a habit that a lot of students have when it comes to studying. And part of why they might cram is they don't quite understand what is the actual long-term goal of their education. So in academics, durable learning is the long game that you should be interested in. So when you have a test, uh, you might leave it to the last minute or maybe justify it uh, that you don't have time to study ahead of time. And then the night before, you might put in a long study session uh, preparing for that test. However, I'll show you some data that shows you that taking that same amount of time that you put into cramming the night before by simply spreading it out over a few days, the same total amount of time leads to significantly better results. Not only that, if you think beyond the initial test, there's going to be a final exam. And what a lot of research on cramming has shown is that even if you manage to somehow get by that test, it's that short-term learning is lost. And when it comes time to the final exam, you're going to just have to reinvest that time again and relearn everything uh, and put in just about the same amount of time. Not only that, you're going to have all the other units of information that you've also been cramming all year long. And when it comes to the final exam, you're going to have a lot of work to do. Now, if you look even further ahead, especially when you get to university, some of those courses that you take in first year act as prerequisites for the courses that follow in second year and beyond. And so when you go to that course, the professor is going to assume that you know and understand and can apply the information that you learn in that prerequisite course. And there might be multiple courses. So in my course, for example, uh, we have a prerequisite of biology. Uh, and so going on into that second year course, your professor is going to assume that you understand the biology, you understand that introductory psychology course, and if you've been cramming all this time, you're not going to be able to remember that information for the long term. Okay, let me just show you uh, a study that sort of backs up what I'm saying here. So in this study by Cornell, he brought people into a lab and he had them do uh, an academic activity that they would have to do anyway. So these students were studying for a test that's called the GRE test. This is a test that you have to take to get into graduate school. And one of the components of this test is to memorize uh, vocabulary words. And so a good way actually to memorize vocabulary words is to use a flashcard method where on one side of the flashcard you have the word and on the opposite side you can have the definition and examples of sentences and you can use this method to practice uh, your recall and ideally to come up with your own sentences so you can really uh, ingrain that memory. Now, he had two groups of people studying for this test. Both groups studied for eight hours. In one group, he had them studying 
eight hours the day before the test. So this is the cramming group. The other group he had studying two times a day over the four days leading up to the test. So in both groups, they are studying for the same total number of hours for this test. So how do they perform? Significantly different. If you space out your studying across several days, as opposed to just cramming the night before, even if it's the same total amount of time, you're going to understand and remember more of those vocabulary words. Now, let's extend this to an actual classroom setting. So part of my research, what I'm interested in doing is running controlled lab studies where we could try to figure out what's going on. But I'm also interested in understanding what happens when we go out into the actual classroom. So here's a study where uh, it was done by a colleague of uh, mine, uh, John Donlosky and Catherine Rawson at Kent State University. Uh, they took students who were taking a large introductory psychology course, and the instructor provided key concepts that were being taught in the course uh, from eight different units. And each person in this study was, uh, was assigned uh, these keywords as part of their experiment. So 32 of these keywords, they were uh, assigned to study uh, with aid under a condition called successive relearning, which I'll talk to you in a, in a moment about. And 32 of them were a baseline condition. So there was no extra uh, effort or attention uh, given to these 32 words. The actual words used by uh, various students varied to uh, counterbalance. And for the successive relearning, this is what happened. Students came into uh, a study group. They had an initial learning phase of these key concepts using flashcards. And then they had to return three more times to practice and relearn these flashcard words. Um, and as I said, these are actual concepts that are being taught in the course. So one of the things that the experimenters could do is, well, okay, in the actual course, how do they perform on these words? So half the words, 32, they went through successive relearning, and the other half, they just saw how they performed. So here's how they actually did on the final exam. So the successive relearning words where they were forced to go through and uh, learn these flashcard words, uh, each study session lasted, I think, about half an hour. So in total, they're putting in two hours across an entire semester. So a pretty small investment. And you could see that on the final exam, compared to the baseline condition key concepts, there's a significant difference here. So there was a net benefit from this small investment of spaced out studying. But I said the real goal here is durable learning. So as instructors, this is typically the final formal uh, evaluation that we make. But they had a chance to look three days after the exam and 24 days after the exam to measure the impact of long-term learning. Here's what happens three days after the exam. This is the words that they studied just with, along with their regular study. Three days after the exam, they don't remember anything. They're almost performing at chance levels. However, the words in which they had invested just two hours through the successive relearning paradigm, there is some drop but it's a pretty small drop. They have maintained this information for the long term. Now, if you look out at 24 days, again, there's, a there's another drop here to 17%. And there's a drop here, but it's only to 64%. Remember, during this time, there's no more studying being done. This is just the investment that was made for the final exam. 24, hour 24 days later, this group is still maintaining uh, that learned information. OK, so I talk about this actually in my introductory psychology class. Uh, one of the themes of this course is really learning how to learn. And here's what one of my students wrote uh, when I told them about the importance of studying. For the first time, I feel really good about my Mac Interslide quiz. Of course, studying for four hours straight beforehand helps. 
that's great that you're studying, but I wrote back, it's great to hear, of course, those same four hours spaced out over time would have been even better. Okay, so the first point that I want to conclude with then in this idea of sharpening the saw is understanding the goal. Your goal should be not to study for the short term, to just get you by the immediate uh, fire that you have to put out, that immediate test, that immediate assignment. You should be looking ahead and thinking about the long-term investment that you want to make that moves beyond this test, it goes to the final exam, and on to building your, uh, building your knowledge base for courses that follow. Okay. Durable learning begins with effortful and focused attention. One of the things that's really important to understand about the human cognitive architecture are the limitations. And human beings generally are not very aware of how limited uh, our cognitive abilities could be. And one of the ways that I demonstrate how limited our attention is, is with this demonstration that I show my introductory psychology students. Some of you might have seen this video before, but here's what I want you to do. There are two teams uh, that are gonna be passing a ball back and forth. I want you to count the total number of uh, passes made by the team in white, okay? So see if you can do that. Okay, so as I said, human attention is limited. There's only so much that we could take in at a time. How many people did count the number of passes correctly made by the team in white? Anyone have a guess? 13? How many people would agree with 13? Okay, how many people were on each team? Three? Okay. Um, how many men were there and how many women were there? One woman? Are you sure? Okay. Um, there was another very dramatic event that happened during this video. Uh, some of you might have noticed it. Uh, there was a gorilla that walked, a man in a gorilla suit that walked by uh, in this video. Is there anyone here that did not see that? Okay, I'll show you the video one more time. This is what some of you missed. <laughs> Sometimes uh, my students think I just made up this video afterwards. This is the exact video that you saw. Uh, so what this demonstrates are the limits of our attentional system. So it's something that you have to be very sensitive about when you are trying to allocate your attention. Um, and even when you are sensitive to this, um, and I'm telling you to focus your attention, things can be very challenging. So what I want you to do right now is, I'm gonna ask you a question that um, a grade school student would be able to answer, okay? There's no tricks here. This is uh, one question that's part of a three question test that's called the cognitive reflection test. Uh, I wonder if you can get it right. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. So how much does each item cost? What I want you to do is resist the temptation to just go with your gut feeling and actually focus your attention and make a calculation here, okay? Does anyone want to venture a guess? <laughs> Who, okay, back there, yeah, in the purple. Yeah. Round, but okay. Oh. Uh, the dollar five, uh, for the bat, five cents for the ball. Okay, did everyone get that? Five cents and a dollar five. A lot of people think the answer is one dollar for one item and 10 cents for the other item. But that would not 
actually work out? The correct answer is five cents and a dollar five. Why most people get this question wrong is that they are not actually making an effort to make the calculation. They are going with what feels right. They are going with a reflexive answer. Um, five cents and a dollar five cents, it doesn't even feel like the right answer here. Okay, given that you went through this problem, I'm gonna give you what's called a transfer problem. So a similar type of problem. Now that you've learned this lesson, you're gonna focus your attention, actually make a calculation. What is the answer here? A Corvette and a BMW together cost $190,000. The Corvette costs 100,000 more than the BMW. How much does each car cost? I see a quick response over here. Okay, let's go right here. What's the answer? That's right. But most people, again, get this question wrong because people are not uh, directly focusing their attention. Okay. Now, how is this relevant to your studying? Uh, we, because we have limited uh, attentional resources, we have to be very aware of that, and almost budget that out. Uh, when you're studying, if this is how your computer screen looks, you're dividing your attention. And when you're dividing your attention, you're going to get less return. You're not going to be able to handle all of the processing. So just like a computer that has uh, many different apps open, you're going to notice that that computer is going to slow down. If you are multitasking, having many different things going on in your mind at once, when you're trying to focus on this primary task and get some deep work done, there's going to be a cost as well. Most people, uh, uh, however, think that they're very good at multitasking until they come into a lab and they actually test themselves out. Here, uh, by the way, this is my daughter Monica, and here she is trying to identify two moving objects. Okay. Um, can you follow these three moving objects? Okay, many people are still good at doing this, and they think, yeah, no problem, I'm good at multitasking. These are my daughter Monica's answers, by the way. Here's four, keep trying to keep track of four different items at once. As you can see, things really start getting much more difficult. So I encourage you to single task. Even if you have a lot of different things to do, resist the temptation to have multiple apps open. If you're trying to do some writing, close down your email application. Uh, seeing that icon bounce or hearing that ring distracts your attention. Even if you don't open that email, you're thinking about that email. I wonder what that email is. Is it something funny? Is it a cat video? Is it some work that I have to do? What's going on? It takes you out of that moment. So shutting down everything, doing a single task at once is much more efficient for your brain. A second important uh, concept is to understand that working memory is a limited cognitive resource as well. There's just only so much information that we can hold in our memory and work with at a given time. So think about all the different things that might be going on in your head when you're highly motivated and you actually want to get some work done. Uh, so this student might be thinking, oh, all these different things I have to do, uh, errands that they have to run. When all of these are swimming around in your head, it becomes that much more difficult to actually focus on the task at hand. Um, I'm actually very interested in uh, this concept of mind wandering and uh, how we can efficiently use our attention. Um, in the extreme case, uh, the cost of 
uh, limited attention and not being mindful to the task at hand are very apparent. As shown in this video here of this bus driver who's multitasking, uh, apparently taking in all this visual information and yet not properly acting upon it. And this uh, unfortunately uh, led to an accident. So, um, one of the first activities I want you to start doing right now is think about how much clutter is in your mind right now. If you have anything in your mind right now, a task that you have to do, an errand, a phone number that you have to remember, anything that you have to do that you do not have written down anywhere else and you're forcing your memory to keep this in an active loop, I'd like you to write it down in your notepad right now. So start creating a list and dumping everything that's in your mind right now that might distract you and not allow you to fully concentrate on this lecture or any other primary task that you're trying to do. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that right now. Any meeting times that you have to remember, a phone number, uh, a, a ticket that you have to buy, a book you have to return. If you're out of milk and you have to buy milk and you're just forcing yourself to remember that in your mind, anything like that, take a moment right now to start jotting down a list. How many people have at least three items so far? Okay. How many people have five? How many people have seven or more? How many people have nine or more? Anyone have 11 or more? Okay, so one of the things that we talk about uh, in memory is that there's only so many units of information that a human memory can hold at a given time. And if you're carrying all this around, I want you to think about how that's interfering with just your conversations that you're having with other people. If you find that your mind is wandering and you feel absent-minded uh, and you're struggling to remember all of these things, it's very simple. All you have to do is write these down as soon as you think of them. Uh, it happens to me all the time. Sometimes in the morning I think, oh, I, I have to get some milk and I'll say, oh, I'll just remember. I'm just going to get some milk. Later on, in the middle of a conversation with someone, I could be thinking, what was that thing I was supposed to get? And it takes me out of the moment, and it makes me miss that information. It might have to be repeated, and I'll, I'll go on to the next thing. Um, so it has this distracting effect. So whenever you can, keep a notebook, write down these uh, events, and collect them into your inbox, freeing your mind of this clutter so that you can focus on the task at hand. There are many different ways you can do this. You can do this just on a notepad, uh, or you can keep, uh, you could use an app. I myself like to do it on an app. Uh, the reason why I like to do that is because then it'll sync with my phone. If I put it into my phone when I get to my computer, it's synced on my computer, so I have this latest list of different things that I'm uh, trying to remember. Uh, these are three apps that I've tried that I like uh, specifically because they are free and they will sync across uh, your various different devices. Uh, one of the apps uh, I'm particularly fond of right now is called Trello and this is a web-based app that's also free. Um, it's, you can use it to just keep track of different tasks that you have to do. So here's three simple lists, things that you have to do, things that you're doing now things that are complete. These are sort of like virtual cards. You can flip the back of a card, say on weekend chores, and you can add checklists here. Um, I actually use this in my teaching 
So I teach a third year course that's completely project based. There are four main projects that uh, students have to do. They, ha they get into groups. So I set up a Trello board here uh, for the four different projects. Uh, and on any, any given card, you can see the different group members. You can flip over a card and see all the different activities that they've completed to get their project done. And it's a great way for me as an instructor to just visually get a sense of where students in my class are at. And they like it because they can see uh, relative to other students and within their own group responsibilities what needs to get done. Okay, so the second conclusion that I want to make uh, is Understand the tools and limitations uh, that you're faced with and act accordingly. So um, think about your limited cognitive resources as a budget and how you're going to allocate that to specific tasks that you want to get done. Okay, let's start talking about uh, making an action plan of where, when, and how to study. So the first point I want to make here is Thinking about deep work, and what I mean by deep work is single task work, where you commit yourself for as short a period as 30 minutes of just doing that task, cutting out all other distractions, and really committing to just getting that piece of work done. But it's hard to do this, I know, because there are so many different distractions around you. This takes a certain degree of self-regulation. You have to learn to delay that immediate gratification, postpone that for uh, a later reward, and get the job done right now. Psychologists have studied this phenomenon through uh, as, in children as young as age four with uh, something called the marshmallow test. So the marshmallow test goes like this. You give a four-year-old the following problem. Here is one marshmallow right now. If you can wait 15 minutes and not eat this, we will give you two marshmallows. And in part, uh, this is thought to be uh, a genetic. There are some things that you might inherit from your parents. Uh, but it's also something that you can actually practice. And so, this has highly influenced my parenting. Uh, so my wife and I, this is my daughter Monica, um, we tr effectively have trained her her entire life to uh, have high self-regulation. So we would go out shopping, we'd buy some kind of dessert, and then I would hand it to Monica and say, this isn't for now. This is for after dinner when we eat dessert. And then she would ask me, oh, can I smell it? I said, sure, you can smell it. Can I t hold it? You can hold it, but you can't lick it. And she just learned, and this just became part of her, uh, uh, her everyday behavior. And so it was with much confidence when she turned four that I gave her the actual marshmallow test. And by the way, she loves marshmallows. So here's Monica being shown the rules. Here's one marshmallow. And she has to wait 15 minutes. So what I tell my students is if a four-year-old can wait 15 minutes, surely you can delay going on to Facebook or Snapchat or whatever social media or other temptation there is for also 15 minutes. So 
while you're trying to study, you have all these temptations. You probably have these open. Even if you aren't uh, actually in actively engaging in them, you're thinking about them by just having them open on your desktop. So how can you fix this behavior? All you have to do is apply instrumental conditioning. So the response that you're interested in is studying behavior. And the reward that you have to delay is, say, engaging in this social media or playing a game. These can act as your reinforcer. Now, the best way to set this up is what we call discriminative stimulus control of this behavior. So you have to cue yourself and remind yourself that you've got this deal going on with yourself. If I study for a while, what follows will be this reward. How do you remind yourself? You have to set up a reliable cue that reminds you, oh yeah, this contingency is valid. Just in case you forgot, if I study for a while, I'm going to get this reward. And it could be anything that you want. So the environment in which you study might be your room. And on your desk, there might be a red lamp. And that red lamp specifically signals to you all I'm going to be doing for the next period is just studying. You turn on that red lamp, that reminds you, oh yeah, at the end of the study period, I'm going to get some sort of reinforcement. If you catch yourself at first drifting and moving on to doing something else, immediately turn off that red lamp, get up, get it out of your system, practice doing this. You want that red lamp to signal to you that this is study time, and once I do this study behavior, I'll follow with this reinforcer. After you do these reinforcers for a while and you get in a few sessions, you could give yourself a much bigger reward. You can watch your favorite episode of a show. Uh, you could meet your friends for coffee, whatever you want to do after you string together a few of these in a row. Uh, I saw some students during the final exam. Uh, one of these students had an orange on his desk while he was writing the exam. And I asked him afterwards, why do you have that orange? And he says, don't you know, that's my discriminative stimulus. That tells me when I'm going to, I have to really focus and pay attention. And now that I'm finished that, I'm gonna go out and celebrate uh, and go get some food. So how long should this actual study period be? Here is a mistake that people make is sort of make, trying to be a hero where they think, okay, I have a lot of work to do. I'm going to go to the library and not get out of that desk for the next five hours. Even after I have to go to the washroom, I'm just going to sit here for five hours. No one could argue that I've, I haven't put in my time. I deserve a good grade. The question is, how long can you actually focus your attention? How, how many people here can focus on reading something and really single task studying for 15 minutes? How many people can do half an hour? How many people could do an hour? Can anyone here study for three hours straight without a break and still be, have a high level of attention? Probably not. I'm sure there are some people that can do that, but most of us cannot. I know that I can't. And so imagine this is your attention levels as a function of time. At first, you're going to be very highly motivated. You're going to have high attention resources. You're going to be paying attention very well. But at some point, let's say right over here, there's diminishing returns on your time. At some point here, your attention levels are going to drop off despite your best efforts. So the longer a task uh, goes on, the more likely your attention levels are going to fall naturally and you're going to start mind wandering and you're going to get less and less return for the investment that you're making. And so this student here, even though they have put in three hours of time, how much of that time has been quality, high attention, focused, deep work? Probably this amount of time right over here. So what is the solution? The solution here is to understand and monitor for yourself what, about what time does my attention levels drop off. That's how long I can study for any given interval. And so 
this student here might say, okay, you know, about 45 minutes to one hour, that's the peak amount of time that I could give in on any session. And so, all you have to do is, that's where you schedule in your break, you get your small reinforcer, and then you come back. And when you come back, you will feel motivated again, your attention levels will uh, reset, and you can start working at another high sustained rate. But then again, your natural uh, attention levels are going to drop, you're going to start mind wandering, and that's where you have your next scheduled break. And at the end of, say, putting in three of these sessions, that's when you could take that big break and do it guilt-free. Okay. Some people want a few you know, little extra steps. So this is something that I use myself sometimes when there's a nagging task that I just have to get done and I just can't find myself motivated enough to get going. I use what's called the Pomodoro Technique. It's named after uh, this tomato uh, timer. First thing you do is pick a task for focused deep work. This might be like something, uh, occasionally I have to write a report and I know it's going to take me two hours to do and I just can't imagine starting to do uh, this work that's just so difficult to do. So, I set the timer for 25 minutes and I begin. And I think, you know what? 25 minutes, that's no big deal. Anyone could do 25 minutes of work. This discriminative stimulus reminds me, at the end of that 25 minutes, I'm going to get to do whatever I want. And that's where I'll take a five minute break. I will get up from my desk, I'll go for a walk, I'll grab a coffee, I'll chat with a friend, I'll do anything except work. The last thing I'll do in this five minute break is go on email or do any other type of uh, work that demands my attention. I will do something that's truly rewarding. I will repeat this for three or four Pomodoros, and then at the end, I will take an extended break for 30 minutes where I can do something really fun. I could watch an episode of a show, I could go for a run, I could go for a, a meal, anything that I want. You could adjust these to whatever lengths of time they're appropriate for you. Maybe 20 minutes is appropriate for you. Maybe you can do 30 to 35 minutes. Your breaks might be five minutes. Maybe you need 10 minutes to really get a full effort, full break. And at the end, uh, maybe that 30 minute break could be an hour. It really depends on your own individual uh, circumstances and what you can afford to do. I find this method really ties everything together and helps me get done the things I really don't want to do on any given day. Okay. Um, Christine mentioned she's a runner. Um, is anyone else here a runner? I'm actually training right now for the Around the Bay race. It's a 30 kilometer race. And anyone who's a runner, you can't do what I did with the sprint triathlon and just think, oh my god, I've got that triathlon tomorrow, I better start training. Um, there's a very specific recommended type of schedule that you should follow for, say, three months training for this race. Um, this sets you up for success. This is being proactive rather than reactive. And in a similar way, I want to try to convince you, you should think this way about your academic work. How many people here have ever seen a show called Iron Chef? This used to be my favorite show. Here's the premise of the show. Um, a uh, competitor comes on and they're going to take on one of these Iron Chefs and on this day, it's revealed to them, by the way, you're going to make an entire meal centering around this magic ingredient. Today, it's going to be peaches. And what typically happens on this show? The chefs run out. They grab the peaches. They just start chopping, sauteing, boiling. And a uh, person on the show, the reporter comes by and saying, what are you doing? And he says, I don't know. I have no idea, but we only have an hour. I just got to keep cooking and chopping. That's what every single chef does except this guy. This guy, he was Iron Chef, uh, I forgot his name, but the first thing that he did in this precious hour was sharpen the saw. He sat down, he has a group of sous chefs, every competitor has sous chefs working with them. He spent five minutes thinking through 
what can I actually do in this hour? What dishes can I make? What can I get people to do? And he would actually write out the menu, the final menu in Japanese calligraphy, and then post that up, and then his team would go. Every other team thought, what is this guy doing? He's using up a valuable five minutes. He was making the best investment of all of them because here he was actually sharpening the saw. So every single day, this is what we should also be doing. We should be actively planning out every day. So many students I see, they feel like they're completely overwhelmed. Fair enough. There's so many things that they have to do. They don't even know where to start. They don't even know when a day has been a good day. There's absolutely no metrics for them. So here's what you, have sh what you should do. What tasks should actually get done today? That's the first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning. I'll look through my calendar. I'll look through my master list. What should I actually do today? And if you are a student, maybe here are the three things that you came up with based on due dates and priorities. Here are three things you have to do. You have to finish off a physics assignment. You have to watch a psychology web module. And you have to pick up groceries. There's no food left in your fridge. These are things that actually have to get done today. The second uh, component here is how much time does it take to do these tasks? So I tell students all the time, you should have a good rough idea how long it takes you to read a book chapter. How long does it take you to do an assignment? How long does it take you to review notes? Because you can't devote unlimited amount of time to each of these tasks because you have a lot of different competing demands. If there was only one thing that you were doing, perhaps you could d throw everything at it, but you have multiple things that you have to do. So it really helps if you can become aware of how long it takes you to do a certain task. The third component then is putting all of this together. When can I actually get these things done in the day? So this student has said, okay, here are the three things I have to do. It's going to take me about an hour and a half for the physics assignment. It'll take me two hours to review the psychology module. And it's going to take me half an hour to do groceries. These are the three things that I uh, would be happy at the end of the day if I had these three things checked off. That would be a win for me. Now, next uh, part of this is to actually look at your schedule. So here are some hard deadlines of places that this student has to be on this given day. So these aren't flexible. So here are appointments that this person has to keep. There's three school appointments and one actual life event. Maybe he's going to a party, maybe going to see a movie, having dinner with friends, visiting family. So these are the only times available during this day that a person can actually get some work done. Here are the three agreed upon tasks that have to get done today. And next, it's just a matter of fitting these in to your actual schedule. Now, this sounds like, first of all, it sounds like just common sense. And secondly, it also sounds idealistic. Like how, like every single day you're planning out every single minute. No, it's coming up with this game plan there are things that are going to happen in life. Uh, there are spontaneous events that occur. You're not going to always follow this. So I make a schedule like this every day. I actually put it right into my calendar. Do I follow it every single day? No. But I would say I follow it about 80% of the time. If you have no game plan, you'll have very little direction to actually get these things done. And the great thing about following this type of schedule is that it allows you to have some mindfulness during the actual uh, activities that you're doing. And this extends to the fun life events that you're also engaged in too. So there are a, a lot of university students walk around constantly feeling guilty. So when they are hanging out with their friends and they go out to see a movie, part of them is there and part of them is thinking, oh, shouldn't be here. I should really be doing that physics assignment or there's 10 million other things that I have to be doing. And because they have no way to actually measure whether or not they've had a successful day. So by following something like this, when you actually get to this life event, this fun thing that you're doing, you can actually be there. Conversations are completely different. 
when you're not feeling guilty and you're not thinking about other things. Television shows are easier to follow. You can pick up on lots of different things. Food tastes better <laughs> when you actually have a plan like this. So, one activity that I would encourage you to do right now, if this is something that's completely new to you, I know people get very skeptical and think, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but I don't know if I would really do it. Here's what I want you to do right now. Get out your calendar and do this for one task. Whatever upcoming assignment that you have, if there's a meeting you have to prepare for, if there's a test that you have to study for, I want you to right now estimate how much time it takes to do this task. It might take one hour, it might take four hours. Then look in your calendar and schedule three to four space study sessions right now and actually put these appointments into your calendar. And then if you're feeling good about that, repeat these for other major tasks that you have due this week. Every morning, this takes me about five minutes to do. It's a five minute investment every morning of these different activities that I have to do. And then every Sunday, I'll spend at least 15 minutes. So uh, my own rule is that uh, after Friday at five o'clock, I'm no longer checking email. I'm no longer doing any work, even though there's a million things I could be doing. I take all of Friday off. Friday night off, I take all of Saturday off, I take all of Sunday morning off, and then from 12 to 3 on Sunday, this is a, a chance for me to do a weekly review, check in to see how did I do last week uh, in my journal, plan ahead for the next week, and then I'll spend about an hour and a half to two hours uh, devoted to a single task that would get me a jump start on the week ahead. And that's all the work that I do from Friday all the way up until Monday. And it feels great because it gives me lots of time to uh, spend with my family and just recharge. So I'll give you an example. Uh, here is my weekly schedule. So every week I sit down on Sunday and I think, you know, if this was the end of the week, what would feel good? Uh, what tasks do I have to get done that would really make me think, yeah, that was a really great week. And then I'll look at my calendar and I'll write down, I'll make a list of those tasks that I want to get done this week. Uh, so I start this uh, exercise by also reviewing last week's list and then I'll write, I'll spend two, three minutes here just making some notes to myself about how I did, what went wrong, what went well, how I could improve my own practice. And once I have this list like this, it sets me up for the entire week. And so now every morning, I will spend five minutes kind of looking back at this weekly list and making a plan. So uh, here's just like a template that I use. Uh, I'll usually assign myself one big thing that I could get done on a given day, three medium things, and then five small tasks and errands. Uh, and this really keeps me on track. So uh, being a professor, there's multiple projects I'm involved in, and it's so easy to get lost in the, uh, the swamp of all the different competing demands. This gives me uh, my game plan of trying to get ahead. Okay. Um, Let's talk about how people, how students can actually effectively study. The one, the thing that most students focus on, I think, is inputting information, t consuming all that information, but they don't spend enough time on outputting information, practicing retrieval of that information. So, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, John Dunlosky, uh, did a study looking at the most popular study techniques. Uh, and from a student's perspective, the most popular study methods were highlighting or rereading notes or the textbook. Um, on their own, there's nothing necessarily directly wrong with these methods, but if it's the only method that you're using, uh, it could be problematic. And why? It's because these are very passive techniques. So you could imagine if you're highlighting, um, 
a student might start off diligently highlighting uh, things that they think are very relevant uh, and the longer they spend on that task they might just end up highlighting more and more and more uh, eventually turning white pages into yellow pages and doing this for a few hours and coming away honestly convinced you know what I just put in a lot of work I just spent three hours turning these white pages into yellow pages, you almost feel like, I deserve something for this. Uh, I deserve some sort of recognition. I did some hard work. Unfortunately, <clears throat> these have been shown to have very low utility. There's very little actual gains made by doing these passive types of learning. Um, so the other illusion that happens is by just simply passively rereading your notes uh, and never actually testing yourself, it makes you feel like, you know what, I can reread these notes faster and faster with each passing. And this is what we call fluency. And what people mistake fluency for is actual deep understanding of the concepts that they're reading faster and faster. And so, the best methods, the ones with the highest level of utility, are elaborative interrogation, self-explanation, practice testing, and distributed practice. And I'm going to talk about these briefly. So first of all, elaborate uh, interrogation and self-explanation. Uh, these are some things that we try to work into my introductory psychology course. As often as possible in our tutorials, we have uh, activities that really force a person to move beyond just simply memorization and deeper understanding. Uh, one of the fun things that we did was on Twitter uh, for my course, uh, we had a meme contest where students had to uh, illustrate one of the key concepts that uh, is coming up on their exam using a meme. And here's one of my favorites that I found. Um, so this student uh, was trying to explain what functional fixedness is. And this is a concept where um, you see an object and you can't think of any other uses for it except for what it was purposely designed for. So a thumbtack, you could only think of it as uh, 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 putting into a thumbtack board holding papers. Uh, so the student wrote here, I don't know, so this is Liam Neeson, I don't know if you know from that movie, what was that movie called? Taken. Taken. So he's, he's on the phone saying, I don't know what functional fixedness is, but I will find you and use all the tools at my disposal in their intended ways. So <laughs> to understand this joke, uh, you really have to understand what functional fixedness is. So this takes a level of creativity and commitment. So even though the student is doing something fun, it's a great example of elaborative, uh, elaborative interrogation and self-explanation. Instead of just passively reading through a definition of functional fixedness over and over again and not truly understanding what it means, but being able to read it faster and faster. Um, so practice testing and distributed practice. So one of the best things that you can do is force yourself to recall that information. So instead of just passively reading it, uh, maybe cover up your notes, see a key term, and then test yourself. If this was a test right now and I had to explain what functional fixedness is, could I do that? And then test yourself to see how well you've done it. Can you come up with an example that is not given by your teacher? If you can only come up with examples that have been provided for you, that means you're simply memorizing and you haven't actually uh, uh, learned the uh, concept at a deep level. Um, so one of the ways that we could increase this idea of retrieval practice as an instructor is to build it into the course. So in a typical university course, you have a few high stakes uh, testing situations that determine all of your grades. So you might have just two midterms and a final exam. So in my course, one way that I've tried to implement uh, practice, practicing retrieval is to eliminate these high stakes midterms and instead there's a test every single week uh, in my course. So this forces a student to uh, develop habits and also engage in this retrieval practice very regularly. And this leads to better performance on the final exam. So um, how can you promote uh, 
uh, effective study habits. This is something that I'm always interested in. How much does the teacher have to do and how much is on the student end? Ultimately, the student is the one that's going to have to engage in doing these behaviors, but there's some interesting things that uh, instructors can do as well. So here's what I've done in one study. So in phase one, um, we have uh, weekly tests in this course, and uh, we also created practice tests. And when I told students about the uh, benefits of retrieval practice, when we had these practice tests, I thought students would just be all over them and do these practice tests. That's what I naively thought. Uh, about 25% of students actually, did this particip uh, actually participated and did these tests. And when I asked students why, they said, well, the practice tests aren't worth anything, so why would I do it? <laughs> I said, because it's going to help you on your weekly test. So in the first phase, 25% of students actually did it. Um, by the way, oh, uh, uh, one year I thought I was going to be very clever, and I said, and I made it to unlock the real test on Friday. You must do the practice test. And do you know what students did? On the day of the test, they opened up a practice test, randomly answered questions to get to the real test that was actually worth the grades. So I thought, I'll be clever. So in this year, um, uh, I had a phase two where I said, OK, over the next month, if you, finish the, if you do a practice quiz and you complete it, let's say, by Wednesday, like a couple days before your real test, um, and you take it seriously. And by taking it seriously, I meant you had to pass it. You had to get at least 50%. If you did that for the next month, you get to drop your lowest test. And when I did that, 75% of students actually followed through and participated. Then, during phase three, the last month, I said, forget it. We're just going to go back to the way things were. And when we did that, it drops back down to 35% participation. What's interesting is if you look at the grades during phase one and three, and during phase two, during phase two when they were actually incentivized to do the right thing and do these practice tests, grades went up by about 10%. So I showed these to students to try to convince them, yes, doing retrieval practice is a really great thing. Um, so we have these weekly tests. Uh, uh, they're kind of like assignments. And students could conduct these in groups. And one of the things I was interested in looking at is, how actively are you involved in your group? So I asked students on the final exam to characterize their role within a group of doing these weekly assignments. So here are your options. One, I wrote the quizzes on my own. B, I actively listened and absorbed the discussion. C, I actively listened to discussion and occasionally provided input. D, I frequently contribute to the discussion. Or E, I led the discussion for most of the questions. So, what I was trying to get at here was how actively were you involved in a group if you were contributing to this group project? If you read between the lines, B is the person that actually did nothing. They just actively listened and absorbed the discussion. And I wanted to see how your different role within these weekly quizzes would affect your grades. So, here is how people performed on these weekly quizzes, uh, those who did alone. Not surprisingly, when you did it with other people in your group, it increased your grade. But people who were uh, actively contributing and the leader benefited the most. I was most interested to see what happens on the final exam when you are completely on your own and it's really a reflection of how much you've been learning all year long. So, if you wrote the quizzes alone, that was a pretty in good indication of how you performed on the final exam. If you were one of the active contributors, you also did fine. If you were in this group here that was not very actively participating, it was a big surprise on the final exam. And these students performed very poorly. OK. So a conclusion from this section here is planning ahead to be proactive rather than reactive and really taking an active role in your learning, not relying on these passive learning methods. OK. Final uh, point that I want to make is uh, thinking about renewing yourself uh, and revitalizing yourself for the long term. 
So we think, I've talked a lot about the healthy mind, but I also want to talk a little bit about the healthy body. So um, I do some collaborative research with my wife who runs the NeuroFit Lab. She's very interested in how exercise changes brain function. And one of the studies that we were trying to look at, uh, because we know that the more fit you are, uh, the better you perform academically. And one of the things that we were trying to look at was how can we incorporate exercise into actual studying? So here's a study that we did. We had students watch about a week's worth of course content through one of these online web modules that we actually use in our course. So we have actual students who are getting a sneak peek at an upcoming uh, week's course content. So we think they're incentivized to do well here. Um, and we offered, we had groups in three different conditions. One, a control condition where they had no breaks. So this is sort of like the hero condition where they went through the entire week's course content uh, without a break. We had another group where they had a non-exercise break. So they took uh, three five-minute breaks where they could play a computer game. And then we had a third group that was the exercise break group. So during these break times, they actually engage in five minutes of high intensity interval training exercises like jumping jacks and uh, various different exercises. And we were interested to see how these different types of breaks might impact upon their learning. So, we measured attention levels here through mind-wandering probes, and what we found was that the non-exercise breaks groups and the, uh, and the no-breaks groups performed very similarly. However, the exercise break groups in particular were able to maintain focus during their entire study phase. And we were interested, does this actually transfer onto their comprehension and long-term performance? So when we measured uh, their comprehension scores immediately and 48 hour, hours later, we found that the exercise rate groups completely outperformed all the other groups. This gave us some reason to suggest that it might be interested, interesting to look at a longer intervention study. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of sedentary uh, behavior among uh, certain populations of students these days, and getting them uh, motivated to do more exercise might lead to uh, enhanced uh, performance. The last thing I always try to tell students is that in addition to doing exercise, paying attention to sleep, uh, you should also have interesting, fun things to look forward to. So I really try to encourage students to take part in all the interesting things that are going on campus and have those really fun life events planned into their schedule uh, where they could pay attention to. So, the final conclusion then is to make restoration and renewal part of your schedule and to make that just as important as every other aspect of that schedule. So I've told you uh, a bit about uh, the theory of the science of learning, some of the research that's come out of my lab and other labs and how we're trying to translate that into the actual classroom. But all of this won't make a difference unless you actually plan these changes into your schedule. So that's something that's up to you. Thank you very much.